The Girl Who Chased Away Sorrow The Diary of Sarah Nita, a Navajo Girl New Mexico, 1864 Written by Anne Turner An evil wind comes. When we reach the top of the low mesa, nothing has changed. Yellow aspen leaves flutter in the wind. Sheep's heels click against stones. I love the soft tearing and muncing sound of the animals eating dry grass. Kaiba hums to herself, and braids a rope out of yucca leaves she's brought with her. I do not know how long we stay there, watching the sheep. From time to time, I run after our bad goat and swat her on the rump with a knotted rope. She is a mischief maker, and the sheep always try to follow her. After the second or third time the goat tries to escape, Kaiba calls to me. She stands at the edge of the mesa, her hair blowing in the wind. She points to the place of the rising sun, where a red cloud smokes up from the earth. What is it? Why does it make me shiver? Trees bend. I try to speak, but my lips are numb. Grabbing a piece of brush, I try to sweep that evil wind away before it can bring harm to us. Kaiba calls, What is that cloud, sister? But I cannot answer, and I open and shut my mouth silently like a caught fish. Our dog is crazy. Kaiba holds her hand out to me. Somehow, I move over the dry ground. The sheep are still grazing, but the dog's ruff is raised as he looks toward the red cloud. When I grab my sister's hand, we look toward home. Why are you afraid, Serenita? What's wrong? Down below are the two hogans and the small figures of our family working. Smoke rises from my mother's fire. But beyond the Hogans, that red cloud comes closer. Closer. Is it a storm? Kaiba asks in a voice so thin it is like spider silk. Out of the dust come horses with blue figures on them. Something gleams in the sun, like light on mica. I hear a pop, then another. Then the sound of someone screaming. Oh, let it not be our mother. Together, we race for the path that will take us down to them. But the dog is faster than we are, darting ahead and blocking the narrow way down. Lips pulled back, he snarls at us. Silvercoat! I shout at him. Get away! But he does not obey me and stands in front, baring his teeth. Kaiba tries to run past, but he jumps forward and nips her leg. Something pounds inside my body, and I hit Silvercoat with the knotted rope. I have to get down that path. The dog flinches, but does not move, growling so loudly and fiercely that I am afraid he will bite me too. That terrible scream comes again, like a chindi, a ghost, near a death hogan, and we cover our ears. Huddled together, afraid of the people in blue and afraid of the dog, we don't know where to go. Below, red flames leap from our hogans, and Kaiba groans. Men in blue, mounted on horses, round up our horses and drive them and our family ahead over the land. Again we try to get to the path, but Silvercoat plants his feet on the earth and will not move. We cannot go forward. We cannot go back. Kaiba opens her mouth and lets out a sound like a ghost crying. And the dog howls with her. Silvercoat lets us pass. How long does it take for evil to come? To break everything you know? Like that evil giant of long ago who smashed huge trees and boulders. I wish Monster Slayer were here right now, to save us and kill those blue soldiers. But he lived in the long ago time, 
Not now. And we can only stand on the mesa, watching our family become smaller and smaller, like birds flying out of sight, until they disappear behind a rise in the land. Sometime later, when the sun is low in the sky, Silvercoat steps forward and bows to me, waving his tail. Kaiba will not go near him, afraid he has gone crazy. Gently, I hold out a hand to him, and he wags his tail. Then I know he was protecting us, and now that the soldiers are far away, he does not have to guard us anymore. Holding our arms across our chests, Sister and I herd the sheep down from the mesa. I think that when terrible things happen, you keep doing everyday things. The sun shines, the leaves blow, and we herd our sheep. We don't talk. Walking slowly at first, then running ahead of the sheep to our hogans. At the edge of camp, we stop, hands clapped to our mouths. There is a bitter choking smell from the burning hogans. Flames and black smoke pour into the sky. Things are scattered all over the ground. Mother's metal pot, a sack of food, a bone tool, two sheepskins. The sheep clatter over the ground as Silvercoat rounds them up, driving them into the corral. Kyber remembers to run over, close the brushwood gate, and come back to me. Even though I know they are gone, I can't help calling out. Mother? Father? Aunt and uncle? Cousins? As if they could answer from far away. But there are no voices, just the evil crackling of the fire. I hear a wounded animal sound that makes me turn around to see where it is coming from. It isn't Kaiba. It isn't the dog. It is me. Kaiba tells me to hide. Sister tugs on my hand, saying the soldiers might come back and we must hide. Before we leave, I grab the sheepskins and the sack of food from the ground. Some other girl is doing these things, not I. Some other person is thinking about food, about shelter, and sleeping. The girl that is Serenita is hiding deep inside, saying over and over to herself, Where is my mother? Where is father? Are you alive? Our things bump against us as we run away from the burning hogans to a stretch of junipers on a low hill. Is it far enough away? Is any place far enough away from what has happened? While Silvercoat stands guard, we crawl in under the shelter of two large junipers growing together. It feels safe behind the green wall of pine needles. I remember that this is a place Kaiba and I played in when we were younger, making dolls out of corn stalks and pieces of old cloth. It was a safe place, a happy place. Arms wrapped around each other, we pull the sheepskins over us. I do not know if I am even hungry or tired. I am just a body, a shivering body. I hit Silvercoat. When Kaiba stirs beside me and a dog noses my leg, I keep my eyes shut. If I stay very still and do not open my eyes, maybe everything will be the same. Soon Mother will call to us to get up. Soon Swift Pony will come to tease me. But my stomach grumbles, and a cold wind stirs my hair. Kaiba moans, rubs her face with one sooty hand, and sits up. All the cool air rushes in when she pushes back the sheepskins. Sister? Her voice is cracked and frightened. I tell her that we are still here, near our home, and that I am with her, and we will be all right. But my lips are trembling so that the words come out all wrong and Kaiba cannot understand me. We creep out from under the juniper branches into air that feels sharp and dangerous, where the blue sky is too big. 
walking hunched over, I make myself go up to the smoldering hogans. When Silvercoat lifts his head and howls, I hit him on the ear. He runs away, and Kaiba says, Serenita, he did nothing wrong! I cannot tell her what I am thinking. No one can cry, not even the dog. If we are to survive this evil time, we must be brave. I wait for words inside. I feel as if aspen leaves are fluttering in the middle of my body. If I do not hold myself together like a blanket bound tight with rope, I will fall into pieces. The only thing I can do is to pretend to be brave, like my father going off on a raid. Standing straight and tall, I touch the white shell necklace mother gave me, the shell that is sacred to our holy person, changing woman. I remember how she gave birth to the twin heroes who killed the monsters that were harming our people. I remember how brave she was, how she cared for the Diné. But still, still I am trembling inside. Sister? Kaiba jumps, grabbing my arm. Suddenly, words pour out of her like a summer rain rushing down a canyon. I think our fear kept us silent before. What will we do? And where are father and mother? And should we follow them? She asks. Maybe we should try to catch up with the soldiers, and then we would all be together. But then we would be prisoners, she gasps. When I put my hand on her shoulder, she stops. It is too dangerous to follow them, I say. And we don't know where they are going, or what is in the minds of the blue soldiers. We are only two girls. Two brave girls, I remind her who cannot fight against the blue men on horses. Then where will we go? She wails, kneeling on the ground. My mother, if you were here, what would you answer? Tell me what to do. I kneel on the ground beside my sister, waiting for words to come, waiting the way I used to in front of our hogan, looking for the first sight of father coming home from a raid. You have family in Sei. The tall walls will hide you. Go there. Suddenly the words are inside, and I think it is the voice of my mother, helping me to stop trembling, helping me to be brave. Sei. The word pops out. Holding tight to our dog, Kaiba gives me that look again, just like the time I told the story of the girl who chased away sorrow. She thinks I know what to do, that I will take care of things. So I must pretend to know. I remind her that father said the canyon was a little over a week's journey away, north and toward the setting sun, and that we have family there. As long as we keep the place where the sun rises behind our right shoulders, we will find it. My words fall like pebbles into the waterhole. Now... I must act as if I believe them. I try to get the knife. Somehow, we make ourselves move past the yawning mouths of those two smashed doorways. The place where we sang songs, ate our meals, snuggled close to our family on cold winter nights. I have rolled up the two sheepskins, and I'm carrying them on my back. Kaiba picks up Mother's gourd outside her hogan finding a sack of dried pumpkin that was tossed aside by the fire. She grabs a bag of ground corn, too. Here's Mother's pot, sister! And look, her flint! Triumphantly, she waves it at me. But I am thinking of something else right now, afraid of what I must do. Slowly, I go up to Mother's hogan. If I can just reach through the door, no one has died here. I did count how many were led away by the soldiers. Six for our family, fourteen for the men in blue. I know where she kept her knife, the one father brought back from a raid. It was on a ledge to the right of the smashed doorway. We will need it to cut up animals we hunt on the way, and to protect us from puma and wolves. Slowly I stretch out my arm to the dark opening. Blackness flows out of it, and a terrible smell. Ay! I shout, and take to my heels. 
Running, I see nothing but a blur of red, blue, and brown. Something runs beside me, I do not know what, and it pants and breathes and whispers. We cannot run any more. Silvercoat stops first, his tongue lolling. Even though the wind is cool today, sweat pours off our bodies, soaking our dresses. The dog's tail drags in the dust, and suddenly I feel the weight and the heat of the sheepskins against my back. Kaiba complains that the gourd and pot have been knocking against her waist, hurting her. We collapse on the ground, pouring water into our throats. I know we should save more for later, but we are so thirsty. Don't forget Silvercoat! Kaiba trickles a little water into his open mouth, but it is not enough, and he begs with his eyes and waving tail. When we are cooled down, we mix some of the cornmeal with water. Every time I swallow, I see our hogan. I see my mother, father, aunt, and uncle, Swift Pony and Sideji. Then my throat closes, and I can't eat anymore. Rising, we go on, brushing past dried grass, rabbit brush, and prickly pear cactus. I know that if we are very hungry, we can always roast the cactus in a fire, pull out the thorns, and eat it. I remember to look up and check the position of the sun. It is directly overhead, and where it rises is beside my right shoulder. We are going the right way. We are like hunted rabbits. The longer we walk, the more afraid I am. I think I hear Chindi, ghosts, crying in the wind. I keep looking over my shoulder for soldiers. When Kaiba starts and dashes, Behind a tree, I follow. Crouched in the safe shade, we stay for a while, until our hearts stop thumping. We are like Ga, that boys hunt. Rabbits darting from side to side, zigzagging to get away from their killers. We find a hiding place. We keep to the shadows of juniper and pinyon pines. My head is buzzing like a bee tree, and my breath sounds like someone crying. I am trying to be brave, like an Navajo warrior, or like Changing Woman. But I don't feel brave. What will we do if we see other soldiers? Every tree is a place to hide. Every shadow is a place to lie down in. But soon the shadows are longer, darker, like blood. And I turn uphill, grabbing Sister's hand. The flat land feels too dangerous now and we crawl up the pine-covered slopes, the dog just behind. What are you looking for, sister? Kaiba pants beside me, the metal pot making a lonely creaking sound. I will know when I find it, I tell her. Finally, near the top of the hill, I see an old pinyon pine, with its branches drooping to the ground. On my knees, I pull Kaiba in after me, and we curl up under the branches with our arms around each other. Together, we get warm enough so that we can stop shivering. Sitting up, Kaiba brushes the hair from her face, offering me cornmeal from the sack. But it is so hard to swallow that dry food with only a small drink of water from the gourd. My mother, where are you now? My father, what are they doing to you and to all of my family? Now the sun is setting, and the pictures in my mind are so terrifying that I look at the ground. Ants are carrying tiny pieces of food back to their nests. I wish I could be as small as one, hidden in the earth. Different kinds of pictures and words begin to float inside of me. Once, in the long ago time, there were ant people, I begin. Maybe somewhere behind these red hills, there still are some ant people alive. I know, I say to sister's look of disbelief, that they lived in the second world before people came to be. The words calm my breathing, calm the pounding in my chest. But maybe two of the ant people crept through those hollow reeds so long ago because they wanted to see the sun in the glittering world. And unseen, 
They crept up here and had many beautiful, smart children. The task of those children is to guide lost the net children and keep them safe. Kaiba leans against me and sighs. We can't see them, but they're there, just beyond the ridge on that hill and in a hollow over there. They will dim the sight of the white men when they come looking for us. They will help us scurry as fast as they do to hiding places along the way, and to our final hiding place in Sei. The words hang in the air like sweet wood smoke from home. Kaiba pats my arm as we unroll the sheepskins and pull them up to our chins. Darkness comes, and I dream of swift and clever ant children guiding us, keeping us safe. I dare to make a fire. When I wake, it is still dark. Silvercoat is lying on top of our legs, and I have to ease myself out from under him. But no one stirs. My sister and the dog are too tired. Walking around the hillside, I gather some firewood. For I have decided that today we will have a fire and cook corn mush. After I have a pile, I make a smaller nest of dried tinder to catch the spark of shredded cedar bark and pine needles. I thank Changi Woman that we have a metal pot to cook in and cornmeal from home. When I strike the flint, the spark catches in the tinder. I blow on it and drop it onto the wood, jumping when the cold nose pokes my elbow. Silver coat, I shout, don't do that! But he bows to me, stretching and wagging his tail, and I have to forgive him. Kaiba crawls out of her sheepskin and crouches by the fire as I fan it with a piece of bark. She sighs, holding her hand out to the flame. She tells me our sleeping tree is so secret and hidden that the ant children must have helped us. I pat her hand, glad that she is with me, that I am not alone but Kaiba still looks to me as if I were the grown-up. I know better. Anything can happen on our way to Tsei. And if we die, caught by animals or soldiers, no one will ever know. I remember storing the corn. When Kaiba and I scooped the cooked corn mush onto pieces of bark, we remember to thank the holy people for it. I think about that day when we put golden corn into bags for winter. This is some of that corn, something my mother touched. Will it bring us good luck? We see blue soldiers. As soon as we are done, Kaiba and I scrape dirt over the fire. Just as the last wisp of smoke sails up, Kaiba stops moving, and the dog points his nose towards the flat land below. Sister motions to me. Then I hear it too, the pounding of hooves. Quickly, we head for our shelter of last night, dragging everything under the branches and lying flat. But being so close to the earth, it is hard to see. Thick grass and juniper makes it hard to see. Holding tight to our dog's coat, I peer through the branches, trying to see what is happening. My heart pounds so that I feel sick. Kaiba's eyes are squeezed shut and her lips are moving. Is she praying for our safety? The sound of galloping stops. I see a flash of blue below and hear loud voices, thick, harsh sounds. I am so afraid that my stomach clenches in and I think I will be sick. Oh, ant people, dim the sight of the blue soldiers. Keep us hidden like ants in the sand. Come here! Comes from below. Someone answers in a voice that lashes like a whip. Kaiba grabs my hand, squeezing so tight I almost cry out. A horse whinnies, someone shouts, and the galloping starts up again, growing fainter and fainter. I dare to raise my head, then my body, so I can see through the branches. Soldiers moving fast over the red land, away from us. They are heading toward the rising sun, not the direction we are going. All we can do is press our hands to our mouths, willing that corn mush to stay inside until we are calm enough to go on. 
changing woman will show us the way. We finish the last of our water after the sun sets. Then we curl up to sleep under two juniper trees. We did not go far this day, too frightened by the sight of those blue soldiers. I am trying not to worry, listening for my mother's voice inside. But there are no words, only wind and the junipers. And when we put our heads down, my throat feels like a gully in the summer heat. The next day we set off with the rising sun on our right. I do not know if we are heading straight for Tsei, but I touch my white shell necklace and pray that changing woman will show us the way and help us find water. For now our gourd is almost empty and my mouth feels like dust. We walk and walk, our heels making half circles in the red dirt. Kaiba does not say a word, just presses her lips together. Is she thinking of mother's words? Remember, the Dene are strong. A Dene girl does not complain. The blue sky hurts my eyes, and the red of the mesas reminds me of home. Grabbing Kaiba's hand, I hold as tight as I can. She squeezes back, but does not say a word. Silvercoat finds water. When the sun is high overhead, we stop and eat some dry cornmeal. It feels like sand in my throat. Kaiba is trying to swallow, but she chokes on the dusty food and spits some out of her mouth. Suddenly, Silvercoat barks and dashes out of sight. Soldiers? I mouth the sister. But she tells me that was a happy bark, not a warning one. Running around a thicket of bushes, we see something sparkling in the light. Water! Silvercoat is standing in the stream, lapping as fast as he can. We tear off our dusty wool dresses and wade in beside him. But first I scan the landscape for blue soldiers, for the telltale smoke from a fire. There is nothing. Cold, Kaiba says softly, filling the gourd. She puts her face into the water, drinks deeply, and I do the same. Splashing water over our heads, we scoop up gravel from the bottom and rub the dirt off our bodies. Even though the water numbs our skin and makes us gasp, we grin, watching a brown streak swirl away. I remember Swift Pony, how he surprised me the last time we bathed, and my eyes squeezed shut. Where is he now? Will I ever know? The days go on forever. The days blur together like rain washing down a hillside. One day Silvercoat catches a squirrel, and we steal it from him to roast over the fire. We have to spit out the fur again and again. It has a smoky, charred taste. But Silvercoat doesn't seem to mind. One day, we find water again and fill the gourd. Another day, we see soldiers in the distance and hide on a hillside, only coming out at night to walk. Sister reminds me that the ant people are keeping us hidden. The other days have no markers, just sweat, tired feet, and huddling together at night under our sheepskins. Kaiba holds up her hand to the light. Eight days, sister. When will we get to Tsei? I am proud of her. She has only complained once on our journey, when her feet hurt. I will not tell her that I am not sure where we are, that I don't know what we will do if we don't reach the canyon soon. I listen for my mother's voice to tell me if we are on the right path, but there are no words inside. If only she were with me right now to tell me she needs a rope to lead me by, I would be so good, so quiet, so calm. Tsei. Scrambling up a hill the next morning, Kaiba stops at the top and points. Look! Below are tall trees with white scaly bark, the kind that grow near water. We skid down the slope, Silvercoat running beside us, and see a blackened field ahead. Kaiba stops, says one word, soldiers, and turns to go back. But I kneel by the field and touch the earth. It is cold. The corn stalks are long dead. Do they belong to the people of the canyon? Together, holding hands, we come to a wide, shallow stream with cottonwoods thick along its edges. 
Quietly, we walk beside the stream, always keeping to the shadow of the trees. But we have to follow the water. It could lead us to the people who planted those fields. As we round a bend in the river, sudden tall pink walls rise up to the blue sky. They had been hidden by the trees before. Tsei! Tsei, I whisper this time, like a word from a sacred song to keep us from evil. We have come to the end of our journey, and somewhere inside those walls are our people.